Francisco and this is Bloomberg Technology coming up in the next hour fallout from Elon Musk's plan to take Tesla private and the controversial delivery of this surprising announcement will it get him in trouble with the SEC plus snap reporting its first ever drop in daily active users what is the company doing to stay on users radar and the SEC postponed the decision on approving a Bitcoin backed ETF pushing Bitcoin down further along with other cryptocurrencies we'll discuss. But first to our top story, Elon Musk could be switching lanes or trying to. On Tuesday, the Tesla CEO sent shockwaves down Wall Street after tweeting that he is considering taking the company private at $420 a share. The board? Apparently not surprised. Tesla directors said they knew last week about Elon Musk's bombshell proposal, but both the board and CEO have a long way to go to convince investors that this idea is credible. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg Businessweek's Max Chafkin, who covers the company, and also with us in Washington, Bloomberg's Ben Bain, who covers the SEC. And, of course, many are wondering, Ben, can he just tweet this in the middle of trading hours, and does he have what he needs to back it up? Well, look, I mean, ultimately the question is going to be, I think, to your second point, um, you know, does, does he have what he needs to back it up? Uh, the SEC has been kind of clear that uh, companies or, or individuals can make uh, announcements about uh, material non-public information through social media. So on its face, uh, tweeting this out on Twitter isn't necessarily a violation. Um, but the issue, as you talk to people, is really going to be about, to the extent that the SEC does decide to look into this, and we don't know that they will or are going to, um, is whether what he said is actually true. Uh, the tweet you pulled up, funding secured. Um, you know, that, 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 that says, you know, he's funding secured. And so people are gonna, gonna kind of be wondering, like, what does that actually, uh, you know, mean? And does he indeed have, uh, you know, have what that tweet indicates? He doubled down on it a few hours later uh, on Tuesday, uh, you know, saying that, that indeed, uh, you know, he did have, he did have investors. So, um, so I guess we're gonna have to see how this plays out. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's gonna really come down to, um, you know, how, how sure was what he said uh, at that time and how much did it actually reflect what, uh, what the reality was. He did double down saying, quote, investor support is confirmed, but we don't have any evidence from our sources or bankers close to the company that inv that investor support is indeed confirmed. You know, uh, to your point that the SEC has decided that it's OK to disseminate information on social media this way. That dates back actually to a rule um, the SEC made um, back in 2013 uh, in regards to Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, who at the time announced some um, pretty important numbers on Facebook. The SEC decided that that was OK. But to this point of funding, Max, what do we know about who could be supporting it, this, and if indeed they are. So the universe of possible funders is pretty small. Um, we're talking about uh, sort of sovereign wealth funds, and, and, and of course the um, you know the Saudis. It, the reports came out just before these tweets started that uh, the Saudi Public Investment Fund had up to five percent in, in Tesla. So you could imagine um, a big sovereign wealth fund a big tech uh, sort of venture investor like SoftBank or a big tech company like an Apple or a Google. Um, in terms of like a traditional, normally th this kind of deal will be like a leveraged buyout, but companies that are normally, you know, targets for leveraged buyouts have, have profits and, and that's not something that Tesla has. So it would be more like trying to turn Tesla into something like Uber, uh, a, you know, basically a high potential private company with a very high valuation. Meantime, this is a company, I have this chart in my GTV library showing Tesla's um, free cash flow. This is a company that has never made money and has been burning billions and billions of dollars worth of cash um, every year, essentially. Ben, what are your sources on the regulatory side saying about what happens next? What are they going to look into? So look, I mean, this is, you know, and this is maybe kind of to the point of why, uh, 
CEOs and corporate executives don't usually announce this kind of stuff on Twitter. Um, this is like a long, deliberative process. Uh, so even if this were to move forward, we're talking months here of, of back and forth where probably the board would have to form some kind of special committee to actually look at this. Um, there's going to be lots of lawyers. There's going to be lots of back and forth. And don't forget, investors uh, you know, who feel that this isn't the right deal could also take legal action. So what we're basically hearing right now is that we have to see how this is actually you know, going to play out. Um, the tack that, that, that Elon Musk ultimately takes here will go a long way in also determining how he's going to be have to deal with uh, Delaware state law too because don't forget Tesla is a uh, you know is a company that's registered in Delaware so um, so really you know we're, we're kind of uh, trying to to get a sense here of of where this goes and and the funding question I think is really central to all of that he says he has funding where is the funding going to come from and what does that deal ultimately look like Max, you know, what do you make of a potential SoftBank Tesla tie-up? I mean, I think it, you know, it, it makes a certain sense. I, my my read, you know, in terms of close reading what Musk has said, sort of publicly, what's on Twitter, is that he's hoping to kind of cobble this together from perhaps multiple sources. He's, he said that he hopes that existing shareholders, so so probably think, having in mind the big institutional shareholders, uh, Vanguard, Fidelity, they will sort of maintain their stakes. They're also investors in, in private companies, so maybe that makes some sense. And then you buy out whoever's left with money from SoftBank and maybe one or two other investors. Uh, just some more details on this story. Apparently, Elon Musk and uh, Masayoshi Sun so talked last year in April of 2017 about the possibility of um, going private. Obviously they didn't come to an agreement then so who knows what kind of agreement they may or may not have now. Max what are next steps on the Tesla side? I mean the chain of events is intriguing given that Musk tweeted this then we saw the blog post and the email to employees then we we heard uh, from the board about their support that they'd been talking about this uh, over the last Weak, um, but what does Tesla need to prove here? Yeah, it's it's a it's a crazy story. I mean, when you look at um, the Dell buyout, that thing played out over months. As as Ben said, there were committees, there were lawyers, there were bankers, and all of this seems to have happened. You know, sort of like the best case scenario um, in terms of them planning ahead was a week. So you got to think there's just so much to be figured out and all this is going to be playing out in an environment where Tesla is very polarizing you still have these short sellers you know they're they're probably feeling quite a bit of pain now but they're still out there still plenty of skeptics and you have you know this in enormous uh, right now anyway distraction that that as the company's trying to you know make as many cars as possible they're going to be locked in this you know crazy you know buyout drama even even these buyouts when they're managed well lead to litigation you know sniping all these things and when it happens in this kind of nutty way uh, it's it you know you just imagine it could be even worse. Right. I should add that our sources are telling us there are no active talks between SoftBank and Tesla now, as far as our sources know. But at the time, Musk had proposed a structure that would give him a disproportionate amount of control over the company, though he did say um, in that follow-up blog post that this was not about control. He has enough control. Um, lots to continue to hash out here. Bloomberg Businessweek's Max Chafkin and Bloomberg's Ben Bain in Washington. Thank you both. Well, Salesforce is the latest tech company to embrace the idea of having two chief executives. The San Francisco-based software maker has promoted Keith Block to run the company alongside co-founder Mark Benioff. Block started with Salesforce in 2013 and became chief operating officer in 2016. He also serves as vice chairman. He will also remain a director. Coming up, Snap's second quarter revenue was solid, but its daily active users are on the decline. Are Snap's best days behind it? We'll discuss next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg.
On Tuesday, Snap posted quarterly revenue gains that show it can compete in the mobile ad market dominated by Facebook and Google. The catch? Snap also reported its first ever decline in daily active users. That worries analysts who were looking for rapid growth. Yet Snap did win the endorsement of a key investor, Saudi billionaire Prince Alwadlid Al Al bin Talal, who's taken a $250 million stake. Has Snap hit its peak, or is this just a bump in the road? For more, we are joined by Peter Stabler, senior analyst at Wells Fargo Securities. He's got a market perform rating on the stock, and also with us in New York, Techonomy CEO and our Bloomberg contributing editor, David Kirkpatrick. Um, Peter, how alarming is this sequential decline in users? Well, it's not a great surprise. I mean, they've warned us that the changes they made to the app last year had caused some disruption. And so it's not a great surprise that we saw a little bit of softness. I think the question from here that investors are asking is, can they return to growth and over what time period? They've also been struggling with the, with the Android platform. Um, user experience on Android is somewhat inferior to the iOS, and they've been working on replatforming the app for Android. And it's in test right now, and we'll see if that has the impact of growing Android users, uh, returning the growth to Android users, um, both in the U.S. and globally. But for, for, as of now, they did, they did slip uh, sequentially, and now the big question is whether this trend continues. Right, and David, you know, this isn't something that we saw at Facebook in the early days, or even Twitter. I mean, do you think Snap's best days could be behind it, given we're seeing a sequential decline fairly early in its life cycle. Well, they have a problem that Facebook never really had, and to some extent, Facebook tried to give to Twitter but never successfully gave them, which was they have a head-to-head -head competitor copying their every move, and that's Instagram. And that, I think, is slamming them. On the other hand, their ability to withstand that thus far, I think, is generally impressive, even though they did show this slight decline in, in daily active users. The fact that revenue is going up shows that advertisers, which is really the key constituency, is still are still pretty much happy so what about the revenue um, Peter we're seeing significant revenue growth we're seeing that they are able to compete in a, in a market where it's kind of a duopoly um, what do you make of, of of the fact that even though the user trends are not promising the revenue is Revenue growth in the quarter was over 40%, and that's impressive. But when you dig a little deeper and you look at the regions, you see some trends that could signal some alarm. Uh, you, revenue growth in the U.S. was 20%, it, and the question is whether that decelerates further. Uh, re revenue per user growth in the U.S. was only 12%, comparing to much higher growth in Europe and rest of world. So what investors are looking at is how much more room do they have? Keep in mind that Snap's business in the U.S. is only 3% the size of Facebook's, yet Facebook last quarter grew almost twice as fast. So really, the, you have a question here of what is the headroom on monetization per user, and is the actual design of the app an issue here, and is the demographic skew an issue here? That's what we think. That's our thesis, is that the, the youth skew of the, uh, of the Snap user presents a limiting factor on growth and they have to expand the older users and to David's comment earlier Instagram is a key competitor and they need more older users to open up the categories of advertisers that can spend significant sums on the platform. Instagram certainly a key competitor also responsible for copying a lot of Snap's features and sometimes doing them better than Snap has. David what do you think of that thesis and, and whether Snap can actually succeed at getting older users? Well it's it's a tough challenge. I mean, they have done a good job with product innovation over time, even if every time they do anything it's copied by Instagram. They have been quite innovative. I wouldn't put it past them because I think it's a well-managed, very creative company that they might come up with some way to appeal to older people. But even the brand sort of just shouts teenagers and young people so that to get older people to use it really would be more than even a product design change issue. It would be a branding issue and it could turn off the younger people they still depend on. So that's challenging. The one thing though, I don't think anybody should ever have any illusions. Snap is never going to be a scale of Facebook. It's a good company. It probably still has some potential growth, but don't think it is the next Facebook. It's never going to be. Or, or even the next Twitter, potentially. I mean, Twitter has a, few hundred, a couple hundred million users on Snap at this point. Peter, right. what, what should we read into uh, Prince Alwaleed's investment here? 
He makes a lot of investments. I, I don't frankly read too much into it, to be honest, at this point. The success of shares of Snap are going to succeed or fail based on the revenue growth, based on their ability to expand their audiences. They had a good quarter. They beat on revenue. They beat on, on EBITDA. Um, we, we believe they'll probably turn positive, potentially in 2021. But what does the ultimate margin profile for this company look like? And what kind of revenue growth do you need to get there? That's the question. And what does the revenue growth in the US look like a year from now, two years from now? Keep in mind, Facebook, so much larger, growing twice as fast in the US. Twitter, twice the size of Snap, growing a bit faster. Mm -hmm. All right, Peter Stabler. Wells Fargo, thank you so much. David Kirkpatrick, Techonomy CEO, you're sticking with me. Now, Snap is also betting big on augmented reality advertising, but of course it'll face competition from Facebook and Apple, both getting into that game. How will it hit the bottom line? Bloomberg Tech Sarah Fryer reports. Snap tries to be at the cutting edge of what's next. From spectacles to facial recognition filters. And now they are betting big on augmented reality advertisements. Pizza! Let's go, food lady! The company even opened up an online studio to make it easier for brands to build ads that can be overlaid on people's pictures and videos. On Snapchat, users can manipulate their pictures or videos using augmented reality lenses and animations, some of which are branded, like sunglasses reflecting Domino's Pizza or sipping an AR McCafe cold brew. People then send those photos or videos to friends, essentially becoming the star of the ad. The company's second quarter earnings topped analyst projections, climbing 44% from a year earlier to $262.3 million. More than 80 million people in the U.S. engage with AR monthly, according to the Boston Consulting Group. And AR use is projected to hit 120 million monthly users by 2021. But Snap is already facing competition. Facebook, which has copied Snap before, announced in July that it is also getting into the AR ad space. And they're not alone. Apple is also betting on AR technology, encouraging developers to produce content using its AR kit. Here to tell us more, Bloomberg Tech Sarah Fryer. I feel like we should be going clubbing after listening to that music. Um, but talk to us a little bit about the actual potential for AR advertising to significantly augment, if you will, the amount of revenue that Snap is bringing in. So this company is trying to make the case that it is a camera company, that is something more than just a social communication platform, that they're building something that can then translate to Snap Spectacles down the line and other sort of uses beyond the app itself. Um, the problem there is that this stuff, it, it's hard to build these things. I mean, they're, they're getting better at it. Advertisers are getting more comfortable with it. But when does it turn from an experiment fun thing to do to something that is a, a must have part of the advertising budget? And that's something that has been more difficult for advertisers to come to terms with. They have to be more creative. It's not as simple as just, you know, putting an ad in a news feed. They have to come up with a concept. Um, so I, I do think, you know, it's, it's very interesting. It's what Snap's known for, this kind of creativity. But it is, it is hard to really scale it as well. And quickly, can Snap be more innovative than Apple or Facebook? Or is it go going to become a commodity, if you will? In many ways, Snap has been more innovative, but then you have the copycatting. I mean, Facebook has been doing these ads too. Their Instagram stories, they say, is the, sort of the future of their business. They're trying to drive a lot of advertisers to do ads within stories. So it's going to be a challenge. All right, Bloomer Tech, Sarah Fryer, thanks so much for that report. Up next, Tesla is only the latest example of Saudi Arabia's move into clean tech. But what's the end game? We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. As we've been discussing, Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund just acquired a significant stake in Tesla ahead of Elon Musk's announcement that he is considering taking the company private. And Tesla is just the latest example of Saudi Arabia's interest in clean technology. The kingdom is betting big on clean tech to feed growing domestic energy consumption, and that's been hitting their bottom line. It's all part of Vision 2030, a plan to reduce Saudi's dependence on oil.
and diversify its economy. This year alone, the country announced over $7 billion worth of renewable projects. Here to discuss Damien Sassauer, Bloomberg Intelligence Chief Emerging Markets Credit Strategist. Damien, talk to us a little bit more about why they made this investment and how it fits into the broader end game strategy. Yeah, no, well, I mean, when it comes down to Saudi Arabia, as with most oil producing economies, it's all about oil. I mean, oil comprises 90% of export revenue for Saudi Arabia, and it's also 40% of GDP, right? So as with most emerging markets, and Saudi Arabia is indeed an emerging market, they are trying to wean themselves off of oil dependence. And this has been time tested time and again, Russia, Colombia, Venezuela, Angola, Nigeria, you name it. And what is effectively the challenge here is how do they do it? And for an economy the size of Saudi Arabia, it is indeed a real challenge. I mean, the uh, public investment fund, which is the um, which is the entity that has made the investment into Tesla, um, you know, that's chaired by um, His Royal Highness the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And so, you know, it goes hand in hand with some of the other investments we've seen of late. Um, you know, committing to an investment in SoftBank's uh, Vision Fund, uh, an investment in Uber, um, and they're um, they're upping their stake in Aqua Power, which is one of the largest clean energy producers in the kingdom today. Given the rise in Tesla stock, should we look at this as a strategic investment that certainly aligns with this whole Vision 2030 plan, or is this opportunistic? Absolutely. It is definitely a strategic investment. I mean, one of the pillars of Vision 2030 is to invest in new industries, and clean energy is first among them. And so from that perspective, yes, I mean, if you just look at the core competencies in terms of what Tesla does, you know, battery technology, energy storage, you know, uh, solar panel manufacturing, this goes hand in hand with what the kingdom is trying to do and how it's attempting to diversify its, what, itself away from oil dependence. Are they actually succeeding in that diversification? <laughs> well, you know, uh, the, the verdict is still out. I mean, it's early days, right? So, I mean, if you look at <clears throat> if you look at uh, business investment, it's certainly slowing. If you look at unemployment, unfortunately, unemployment's at its highest point in in, in the last decade. I mean, you have to remember, 250,000 young workers are entering the Saudi workforce each and every year. So, there's some real, you know, real fundamental economic issues that 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 the kingdom needs to contend with. Um, but that being said they have indeed made some real uh, progress in terms of structural reform. They have um, removed some of the fuel subsidies, some of the water subsidies. Um, they have implemented a, a value-added tax. And so, yeah, from that perspective, if you, if you do take the long-term perspective here from the kingdom uh, of Saudi Arabia, I mean, yeah, you know, they have made some real progress, but, but again, it is, it is still early days. Damien Sassauer, Bloomberg Intelligence, thanks so much. Of course, we're going to continue to follow and try to get more information on that stake in Tesla. Coming up, Twitter CEO feeling the heat, especially on Twitter. Why Jack Dorsey's decision to allow a conspiracy theorist to keep operating online has the Twitterverse outraged. Plus, Bitcoin's roller coaster year continues. Is it all over for ETF requests? That's next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey is being reamed for his defense of Twitter refusing to take down the accounts of the infamous conspiracy theorist Alex Jones and his show Infowars. He laid out his reasoning in a series of tweets. We know that's hard for many, but the reason is simple. He hasn't violated our rules. We'll enforce if he does. Dorsey continued to defend the decision by tweeting, if we succumb and simply react to outside pressure rather than straightforward principles, we enforce and evolve impartially regardless of political viewpoints. We become a service that's constructed by our political views, our personal views, excuse me, that can swing in any direction. That's not us. This comes after Jones and Infowars were banned from Facebook and YouTube. Apple and Spotify also removed Jones's podcast from their networks. With us still in New York, we have Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick and in studio Bloomberg Tech's editor Alistair Barr. So, David, is Jack Ryder wrong here? Well, I respect him for what he's saying because he's at least trying to come up with some sort of consistency. But I know there are plenty of people who've been criticizing Twitter in the last day for focusing more on being consistent in that way when it's a very big public person like uh, Alex Jones. And 
not being as consistent when it comes to the myriad in infractions of their rules that happen every day, some of which they take down and some of which they don't. But, you know, we're really at a weird point in the history of these platforms, which is that, you know, they've become such a miasma of conflicting behaviors and, and an absolute lack of governmental oversight and, and regulation and law. And, and they're all sort of struggling with the question of, are we media or are we not? And Twitter is at, is at least Jack's position is Twitter is not media. Twitter is a neutral platform. Therefore, it is not our role to determine what people say or don't say as long as they're not, you know, actively harassing someone or something like that. I respect that. That said, he moves the ball forward by shifting the work to journalists, though he's saying he's not trying to do that. He says accounts like Jones can often sensationalize issues and spread unsubstantiated rumors. So it's critical that journalists document, validate, and refute such information directly so people can form their own opinions. This is what serves the public conversation best. We don't mean to shift the work here. We must build tools to help and need to work together to do that. We can't be a useful service without the integrity journalists bring. Meantime, journalists have responded to this. You've got the LA Times journalist Matt Pierce saying, I'm not getting paid to clean up your website for you. Alistair, are we getting paid to clean up Twitter for Jack Dorsey? I think we're, we're getting paid to uh, clean up and keep the public discourse factual. That, that's, I hope, what we come in every morning to do. Uh, I, th I think one of the, one of the classic um, arguments that, that, that not, not just Twitter makes is if there's something that's out there that's wrong on the Internet, other people have to get out there and say what's right and make it clear so that they can use that content to refute what was wrong before. That, that, those tech, tech companies always say that type of thing. And I, I think that has some validity. And I think Jack is also trying to avoid falling into a trap, which Twitter's fallen into a lot with, with conservative um, commentators on, on Twitter over the last year or so. They basically say, oh, you're, you're limiting our free speech. It's a, it's a, it's a First Amendment issue, and you, you shouldn't be allowed to do that. With this decision so far, he's taking the opposite tack, which is, you know, carry on, carry on, and he's basically saying, maybe not just journalists, but he's saying, you know, everyone else on Twitter, if you feel strongly about it, get on Twitter and refute what he's saying. That said, Twitter has made many mistakes over the years, not making it clear what the rules actually are, then being capricious about how they enforce them. And there's certainly an argument to be made that if Alex Jones doesn't violate the rules, that maybe the rules, maybe there's a problem with the rules. Um, Emily Horn, who's the former head of communications at Twitter, actually hit back at Jack saying, I think it's the wrong call. Jones's behavior isn't a one-off. Twitter started examining offline behavior as a factor in verification last fall. If your policy doesn't account for Jones-like activity on or offline, then the policy isn't serving a healthy conversation. She adds, designing scalable policy on this is incredibly hard. No company will always get it right, but this is an opportunity to take a stand and commit to making and enforcing hard choices in service of promoting healthy conversation. I hope you revisit this decision. David, what do you make of her argument? I just think it's so weird that we're in this position where these for-profit companies are basically in the position of policing the public square. Uh, they were never really set up to have the capability to do that. They do, in the case of Twitter and Facebook, have their terms of service and all that. And, you know, Jack thinks he's doing as good a job as he can do, but it's true that all of these companies swing back and forth like a pendulum or twist themselves like a pretzel or whatever metaphor you want to use and do not show consistency because they're being confronted every day by new kinds of situations which they never really anticipated and particularly in Twitter's case they're not profitable enough like Facebook is to basically throw any kind of money at any problem they might encounter um, so they have to kind of tread a cautious line and then you have this very interesting point that Alistair pointed out about you know conservative bias or no non bias and how they're trying to thread that needle I mean I, I feel for these companies but I feel for Twitter more than I feel for Facebook because I actually think Facebook has handled it much more poorly than Twitter in reality now Alistair Jack uh, talks about them needing to create better economic incentives to prevent this kind of behavior. Former Twitter CEO Dick Costolo has also talked about these things. But what kinds of incentives, economic incentives, would, would prevent this kind of behavior? I mean, not to mention the fact that this is a private company that's entitled to create its own rules about what it does or doesn't want to allow. 
There's always an, there's already an example of, of an incentive. I don't think it's working very well right now, but but um, Politifact and, and, and um, fact checking groups like that um, on on Google Search and also on Facebook, um, there's some financial incentives f for those organisations to go out and, and fact check scurrilous stuff that's on that's on Twitter and other platforms. Um, so he, he might be he might be referring to that. Other than that, I, I would say uh, you know subscribe to your local newspaper. David. What do you think Twitter needs to do better here? <laughs> Jeez. Well, I, I do think, I, again, one of the reasons I respect Jack is even in putting out the statement that you quoted from, he's trying to articulate something which, granted, he hasn't stuck with very well and the company hasn't stuck with historically that well. But I think all of the companies need to be more candid with the public that they understand they are in an unprecedented situation that they can't even fully manage and they need help. So, you know, in, when he asks for journalists to help him, maybe he's not turning to the right places, but they do need to turn to the outside for help. I frankly think government needs to come in and establish some ground rules of what is and is not allowed on these platforms to take a little bit of the burden off the commercial players from making these sometimes impossible decisions. Right. Jack certainly knew that this would be unpopular, I'm sure, when he tweeted it out. Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Bloomberg's Alistair Barr to you as well. Um, I should note that Bloomberg LP operates a global breaking news network on Twitter called TikTok. Well, shares of Match Group hit a nine-month high Thursday following second quarter results that beat analyst estimates. Revenue jumped 36% to $421 million, while operating income hit $150 million, a jump of 81% from a year earlier. Match Group's popular dating app Tinder is viewed as a prominent driver of that success. Tinder saw an 81% increase in subscribers from a year earlier, meaning it now has more than 3.7 million users. Still ahead, Bitcoin enthusiasts may have just had their hopes crushed. Where does the future of cryptocurrency stand? We will discuss. This is Bloomberg. Markets took a hard hit Wednesday after the SEC postponed its decision on a proposed Bitcoin exchange traded fund. The delayed decision on an ETF from VanEck and SolidX, which would have been the first financial product of its kind, reduced the crypto market's value to about $230 billion, the lowest since November. This puts digital assets at a $600 billion loss in total since the peak of cryptomania just six months ago. Here with more on the SEC ruling, Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde joining us from London. The numbers, Caroline, are just so huge when it comes to these losses. Why did this happen? Yeah, really, the wind got taken out the sales. About $500 lost off the price of Bitcoin alone in six hours because so much momentum had been building about this particular exchange traded fund proposed by, as you said, Van Eck and, the, and, and indeed the other key company, Solid X Partners, which is a blockchain technology company. And the reason people were getting excited about this particular ETF is basically some of the provisions they've put in place. They, they, this is going to be a physically backed Bitcoin ETF. They were going to hold Bitcoin. They were going to be promising, promising an insurance policy in case it got hacked or there was theft. They've also been notably saying that they'd follow the framework of the CTFC, like some of the key regulation. They would try to ensure that they followed the way that Bitcoin futures are currently regulated. And I think, crucially, this was going to be very hard for retail investors to get into because the price, the share price of the ETF was going to be so high. It was going to be 200 100,000. This is why, of course, we spoke to the likes of Van Eck about this sort of company. And Van Eck, we spoke to Ed Lopez in particular about why this price point was so important. Have a listen. We know that regulators have a concern about ind uh, individual or retail investors getting into this space because yep. of the volatility. Yep. So if you're at the $200,000 price, you know, you're at a credit investor level. So maybe that's a way for uh, regulators to take a, a small step towards an institutional or regulated product. 
But it seems as though they've had to delay or postpone their overall viewpoint at the SEC. We know that they're nervous about this. They're very wary of giving a green light to the cryptocurrency space, to the digital asset space, because they're worried about manipulation. They're worried about liquidity. They're worried about the price points. And so really, this is something they're being very sensitive to and therefore delayed and pushed it back yet further, even though many in the market had hoped we'd get a decision as soon as, well, next week. But there are still pending applications for ETFs. We just spoke with um, the CEO of Bitwise applying for uh, an ETF that includes not just Bitcoin, but 10 other cryptocurrencies. Yeah. Are we optimistic about future approvals? I think the market still is hoping. They're hoping that the market can institutionalize to a certain extent. And this is why so many companies are putting in these proposals for exchange traded funds. You mentioned Bitwise, but there's also the Canadian company Evolve Funds is getting in there. ProShares is offering up proposals. In fact, we shouldn't be surprised the SEC has just delayed this one on the likes of Vanek and SolidX because they just recently delayed five ETF proposals coming from a company called Direxion Asset Management. So there's plenty out there and, and momentum has been building, I think, in the SEC level in itself because one of the commissioners has actually started to vote against these decisions to push back on ETFs. Remember, just earlier in July, we had from the Winklevoss twins who run the Gemini Exchange, they had their ETF pushed back. But actually, it was a three-to-one ruling. One of the SEC commissioners sees no reason why you should be voting against these sorts of products. So I think uh, there will at some point be the institutional comfort there that these can, it will be a more liquid way of being able to trade this and, and notably that's why we're getting such momentum built into the share price when these sorts of decisions get close because think of what happened to gold when gold got an exchange traded fund backed by we saw gold like quintuple in terms of its price point when when you start to see a market built upon exchange traded funds built upon underlying assets it makes it so much easier to get into the space you don't have to set up a bitcoin wallet you don't have to choose an exchange suddenly you can get into the asset class and it really would drive price momentum and as you can see I mean look, look at GTV chart when you see how much we've seen a crushing in the share price in the in the prices of overall digital currencies I mean we're down by more than 50 percent when you look at Bitcoin we have seen some hope that white line towards the end just recently in July and in August we had seen a little bit of stabilization about the eight thousand dollar mark because there'd been hope that we would see an ETF built on Bitcoin so there's still momentum there I think going forward Quickly, Caroline, has there been any good news for cryptos lately? <laughs> Well, interestingly, actually, this is where the SEC needs support. They want to see more institutionalization of this of this asset class. And maybe we've got some good news in that respect today because it's being reported by Bloomberg that Goldman Sachs is looking at offering a custodian function, basically being able to, to keep your assets safe. This is crucial for institutional investors to get in because they don't always want to keep their cryptos in cold storage by taking it offline. They want to be able to ensure that there's a safe way to manage their assets. So overall, Goldman is looking at maybe providing that. And I think this is why you shouldn't knock back the SEC eventually ruling on an ETF. It might not be in 2018, but eventually it will come because we will see more liquidity in this space. You will see custody provision and we will get bigger players being able to get involved. Bloomberg's Caroline High in London, giving us both sides. Thanks so much, Caroline. <laughs> Well, Slack is said to be raising $400 million in a new funding round. The deal would value the San Francisco-based startup at $7 billion. Slack last raised funds in September when SoftBank's Vision Fund led a $250 million round, valuing the company at about $5 billion. We caught up with Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield for an upcoming episode of Bloomberg Studio 1.0 and asked about the current availability of capital in the venture capital market. The VC market still seemed pretty hot, uh, just in the broad sense. Um, a lot of VCs in the last like three or four years, um, but particularly like the last two years, raised enormous funds, and they need to find places to invest that. Um, but certainly right now, the public markets um, for companies like us, like the enterprise software as a service or SaaS businesses, um, is as hot as it has ever been. Coming up, insurance startup Lemonade has gotten a lot of attention this year after a high-profile investment from SoftBank as well. Now, it is getting serious about luring millennials to the renter's insurance market. We're going to speak with CEO Dan Schreiber next. This is Bloomberg.
Uber Eats is rolling out a new policy with its fees. The company says it will now adjust the booking fee based on the user's proximity to the restaurant. Previously, the cost was a flat charge of $4.99, depending on the city. Now fees will be cheaper for nearby restaurants. Well, since its founding in 2015, the insurance startup Lemonade has grown dramatically by reaching out to a group of people who aren't the usual customers for home and renter's insurance, and that is millennials. But can they hold on and can they grow the market? We are joined by Dan Schreiber, CEO of Lemonade in New York. Also with us, Bloomberg's Julie Verhage, who recently wrote about the company in Bloomberg Business Week. So, Dan, talk to us about the untapped market potential you see here. There's a lot of buzz around you, but the question is sustainability and how big this market can actually grow. Absolutely. Well, the market is absolutely vast. Insurance. Um, runs into the trillions of dollars. It affects every household. And insurance companies often last for 100 or 200 years, which is pretty remarkable. So we see this as a, both an untapped and pretty much an unlimited market opportunity. And we've started with younger consumers typically, but we do run up and down the age bracket. Um, and the nice thing is that those kind of consumers go through their normal life cycle events. So they start off as renters, but they become homeowners, and then they buy and engage in other activities that all require insurance. Talk to us about your short and long-term ambitions here when it comes to renters versus homeowners and um, the, the domestic market versus the international market. Um, our ambitions are expansive. The company is young. We're just marking our third anniversary. Um, but our ambitions are both global, so we expect to launch internationally as soon as the end of this year, um, which is unusual. Insurance companies typically stop at the water's edge, um, but we are looking at a global expansion. And yes, we're covering today homeowners and renters and condos, but Lemonade is an insurance carrier that is licensed to sell any kind of PNC insurance, property and casualty. So you can expect us to be expanding both in terms of the lines that we offer and in terms of the geographies that we cover. Julie, of course, the competitors here are really traditional insurance companies. You know, who's to say they're not going to come in and Bigfoot with the resources that they already have? Right. I mean, I think that that question is still TBD a little bit, but there is this aspect of these companies are all very old. And like we've seen in a number of industries already, is that it's hard for these very old companies to just quickly innovate as fast as a company like Lemonade or another startup can. What you have seen them do, though, is start raising funds where they will go out and invest in different startups, do partnerships with different startups. And that can sort of give them a foot in the water and a way to combat some of this as well. And Dan, I sort of wanted to ask you as well on the reinsurance front. One thing that you guys have benefited from in terms of taking on these larger companies is reinsurance has had pretty good rates recently, and you guys have locked in some large deals, one with Berkshire Hathaway uh, from Warren Buffett. What do you do? Do you expect those costs to remain low, and what do you do if they, if they don't? Is that something that you're concerned about? So reinsurance does play a central role in our model and in a fairly unconventional way. Part of the pillar, one of the pillars of Lemonade is behavioral economics, how to create an insurance company that isn't conflicted with its customers, that doesn't make money by denying claims, and thereby doesn't engender the kind of distrust that really plagues the entire industry. And reinsurance for us is part of the solution. So Lemonade takes a flat fee. If there's money left over at the end of the year, we give it back to charity, actually, to nonprofits of our customers' designation. And that means that we never have any kind of incentive to deny or delay claims. And if there's insufficient funds, then that's where the reinsurance kicks in. So our reinsurance partners are really cardinal partners in making this model of a new, unconflicted business model that speaks to consumers in general and to younger consumers in particular. Got it. And one other thing, you know, marketing-wise, you guys have had a lot of success in growing very quickly, um, which has gotten you a lot of big backers like SoftBank, Sequoia, and others. Your underwriting is something that you've said needs some work in the future, which isn't necessarily too surprising just because these large companies that have been around for almost a century have a lot of data on consumers where they can underwrite pretty well. How do you, do you see that improving enough in the future where you will still be able to lock in these great reinforcements insurance rates and have even potentially better underwriting than someone like an AIG? I think that's exactly right. In fact, 
larger incumbents look at companies like Lemonade and they would like to mimic some of the technology that we've used or some of the marketing or messaging or the consumers that we're attracting. But I think that really is just a bit of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg that's sticking up and is visible today. The 90% of the iceberg of the value that's been created of the revolution or the transformation that is afoot is in the data that is being created as a result of those delightful digital interactions. And what that means is that whereas traditional underwriting and traditional broker-based businesses will look at a group of maybe a million people and see them as a monolithic group because they've onboarded them using 20 data points and at 20 data points n equals a million or 10 million, when you get to a digital interaction with consumers and you get orders of magnitude more insight into them, you start getting into an N equals one. You start being able to look at risks at a far, far, far higher degree of resolution and ultimately become best in class in terms of underwriting and pricing risk. So what has started off as being cool marketing, fast growth, technology enabled, really ends up generating the next, the 21st generation, 21st century incarnation of how to underwrite risk in a way that incumbents, because of their legacy, will have a hard time following. All right, we'll continue to be watching what you do to attract that younger audience. Lemonade CEO Daniel Schreiber, thanks so much, as well as Bloomberg's Julie Verhage. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. On tomorrow's show, we will be covering the Samsung Unpacked event in New York. What is the company doing to fight off competition from Apple and Chinese companies? That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.